Nutrition is often referred to as the fourth discipline within triathlon, particularly long distance triathlon. I mean, you can't do a triathlon without this stuff, but if you get it wrong, well, you could find yourself unable to complete your triathlon at all. So today, with the help of our friends over Precision Fuel and Hydration, we're gonna be running through some of the common nutrition fails and how to prevent them. Okay, mistake number one, too much carb. Yeah, it happens. So these days we hear lots of stories about elite triathletes taking in well over 100 grams of carbohydrate an hour when they're racing in long distance events. It's kind of portrayed that this is routine. And while we definitely know that some elite athletes are doing that and racing very fast, not necessarily just because of it, but with that in their system, it started this sort of trend towards people thinking more is better when it comes to carbohydrates. We've worked with some athletes in the last um, year or two, Justin Metzler, pro Ironman being one of them, who have aimed for some really, really high carbohydrate amounts. He took over 170 grams of carbohydrate on the bike at Ironman St. George, is the World Championships. still around? He is, he lived to tell the tale, <laughs> but he didn't perform at his best. And Justin has subsequently found that actually dialing it back down to, to more around sort of 90, 100 grams an hour has worked really well for him in other races. Um, GI distress is a big issue if you consume that amount of carbohydrate, obviously. You know, it's you're putting a lot into your system. It wasn't that long ago that sports science was sort of telling us that you could only absorb about 60 grams an hour. So really kind of going to those high levels, you've got to ask yourself the question, A, am I going fast enough to warrant that level of energy intake? And B, have I trained myself to take it in and deal with it and have I practiced with that? Because for the average amateur triathlete, even in a long distance race, taking in between 60, 90 grams of carbohydrate an hour, whilst those numbers no longer sound super impressive, actually when we analyze the data from races, that's compatible with a really high level of performance for most people. Okay, mistake number two, conversely, not enough carb. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, typically is a problem we see quite a lot with with amateur athletes that perhaps you know haven't got the resource to access uh, sports nutrition, so they're maybe having like one gel on their three hour long ride and wondering why they're bonking, so to speak, towards the end where they run out of energy and start to feel really really low. So, um, you know, it, it's the carbohydrates that you take in during exercise are, are really important because when you're operating at really high intensity and for long periods of time, that's the predominant fuel source that your body uses. So you only have a finite store within your body pre-exercise that you can draw upon. And once those sources start to run out after sort of 90 minutes, two hours, then it's important to be topping up on the go. If you imagine, you know, you're, 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 you're setting out to, to try and ride for three hours and you've only got enough fuel for two hours, then you're going to have to stop and fill up at some point. What we're aiming to do with, with, with during exercise and triathlons is to, to spread out that fuel intake so that you never get to a point where you, you fall off a cliff, so to speak. And now mistake number three, too much fluid. Yeah, over drinking is definitely a problem with athletes. A big reason for this is that back in the day, I studied sports science in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were told all the time, dehydration is a leading cause of underperformance in endurance sports. And that could be true to the extent that we sweat a lot, especially triathlons often go on in hot environments and sweat rates are really high. So dehydration is a risk. But the problem with the advice that was pushed out in the early days was it was like drink as much as is tolerable, drink as much as you can. There was no ceiling put on or no inference that more was not better. So what we saw was a lot of athletes, you know, drinking, drinking, drinking ahead of thirst because we were also told thirst is not a reliable indicator of how, um, how dehydrated you are. And all of that combined that we started to see cases of over drinking. And now when people over drink, they drink more than they're sweating out or are too high a proportion of what they're sweating out and they don't take enough electrolytes, you can get a condition called hyponatremia, which is very dangerous. Hyponatremia is where you dilute the sodium levels in the blood. It causes a, a cascade of physiological consequences and has even killed some triathletes. There's a famous case in Frankfurt in about 2016, which is I think one of the last recorded instances where someone's died from drinking too much water. So, you know, I was guilty of it as an athlete myself, particularly in the build-up to hot races. 
we all definitely too. Yeah, we yeah. all get told, didn't we? You've got to have a bottle with you. You've got to be topping up. You've got to be drinking loads of fluid in the days before. But actually, you're not a camel. You can't store loads and loads of water. And now, mistake number four: not enough fluid. Yeah. Now, uh, typically, dehydration is quite a common uh, cause of, of poor performance in endurance events. And but sort of understanding what dehydration means for different people can be potentially quite problematic. And so understanding quite how much fluid you need to, to take on during an event can be important. And, and a lot of people sort of can't find that balance. So undertaking some, some sweat loss testing where you're understanding how much you're, you're sweating out during exercise in different conditions can help you prepare to, to drink enough during exercise. Now, commonly dehydration has, has been sort of thrown around in the literature that it's, that it's bad for you. Everybody can tolerate a certain degree of dehydration without it affecting performance. I mean, a recent uh, Ironman finisher study saw that between uh, the top finishers, two and six percent body weight losses was was uh, normal and and wasn't affecting their performance of the the top podium finishers. So we know that there is a range of what you can tolerate and what works for you. Um, and so replacing 100% of your sweat losses isn't necessary, but also ensuring that you are replacing enough so it doesn't start negatively impacting your performance is going to be super important. Five wrong breakfast or dinner prior to a race? Yeah, we've all done it. I raced in Laguna Phuket in, I think it was 2004, the triathlon out there. Fantastic event and I was wanted to make the most of most of my trip and experience the local culture. So I had a really hot curry on the <laughs> beach the night before the race and didn't wake up feeling so good in the morning. So, you know, trying new things the night before the race when it comes to breakfast and, and, and dinner, oh, sorry, dinners and breakfast, not a great idea. I, uh, before a French Grand Prix, uh, the team took us out to a uh, crepe restaurant, crepe starter, main and dessert, which I thought was fantastic at the time. Uh, didn't feel great the next day, very sluggish. Yeah, definitely. There's, you've got to go with, you know, things that are tried and tested, high carbohydrate, low fiber. We sometimes see people like putting in a bit too much, you know, fibrous food, too high fat foods. So actually kind of the type of things you want to be eating the night before in the morning of a race go against the general health advice rather than going for like granary whole grain bread with lots of fiber in it. You're going to want to go for simple plain white bread. You want to have things that are going to be easily digestible whilst the broccoli salad is going to be a lovely thing to eat a lot of the time. It's probably not what you need the night before a race. You want simple white rice and pasta and those sort of things. So How about dairy? Dairy is a bit individual. I think most people tolerate dairy pretty well. You probably know if you don't tolerate lactose, which is the sugar in dairy that causes some people issues. But high levels of dairy, it doesn't contain a lot of carbohydrate in general. It's quite high fat. It's probably something to keep on the, you know, to minimize rather than, I would make my porridge on race morning with more water than with milk, for instance. <laughs> Dedication, that is. <laughs> And now for mistake number six, trying something new on race day. Absolutely, and we've all walked around the expo and thought, oh, that looks nice, I might give that a go or whatever. And, and it can be really, really tempting, or you see friends that are doing it, or you, you, know, you, you, you try someone else's pre-race nutrition, you think, oh, that tastes nice, I'll give it a go. And also to add to that, a lot of races will provide nutrition on course that you maybe haven't used before. Absolutely, and that's why you know getting a, getting a hold of the race schedule and finding out what's going to be on course, if that's going to be your primary you know, fuel source or something that you're even considering, it can be part of a plan that can be flexible, but just understanding exactly what is involved in you know, each gel that's on course, each electrolyte that's on course, etc., can be really important to you know, helping your gut make sure that it's, it's prepared for anything you're about to give it. And so, yeah, the, the pre-race breakfast of, you know, seeing something on the menu and, and think, oh, well, I fancy that, but I've never had it before a race today, we'd certainly recommend steering away from that. And mistake number seven, too much caffeine. Yeah, we all know that caffeine is potentially quite performance enhancing. There's a bit of individual variance on how people respond to it, but if you're someone who drinks, you know, caffeinated drinks on a daily basis and get on well with them, there's a very good chance that the stimulating effect of caffeine and the fatigue suppressing effects of it are useful when you're doing an endurance event. As with most things, if you tell an athlete that taking a bit of something will make them go faster, they're gonna take five times that amount and the problem with caffeine is that you know there's a very strong dose response and there's also a ceiling to how much of a positive response you can get. The guidelines suggest that roughly three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight is kind of like the performance dose 
We've seen athletes kind of blow through that a little bit, going up to nine or 10 milligrams in longer events because caffeine does degrade in the body and you're kind of keeping it topped up. But where you see athletes go crazy with caffeine, it can increase anxiety and jitters before the race. It's definitely, it's um, a stimulant for your gastrointestinal system as well. So it can lead you to having diarrhea and that sort of thing, which is obviously not what you want during the middle of a triathlon. Um, and it can definitely have, you know, kind of problems associated with even things like heart palpitations and making you feel quite anxious if you if you overdo it. So, so using caffeine sensibly in a dose that, that is compatible with performance and one that you've tried and tested is really important. Okay, so now we've run through some of these common problems and issues that people might face. Now, understandably, there's going to be a bit of crossover in the solutions to these, so I'd like to run through that. We'll start with too much carbs, but I imagine we're going to run on to some of the others. Yeah, for sure. I think you're right. There's a, there is a lot of commonality in the solutions to this because having, for instance, if we take too much carb or too little carb, what that comes down to fundamentally is like not having a plan for how much carbohydrate to take in. And it's surprisingly common. I know, embarrassingly, looking back at my career as an athlete, I had only the very vaguest idea going into an Ironman of what I was really aiming for in terms of energy per hour. That would change from race to race because I'd talk to someone and they'd, they'd tell me they're not eating very much and I'd dial down what I was doing and I'd talk to someone else and they were eating loads and I'd be trying to increase it. It was also down to what was available on course and that sort of thing. What, what we found with the the more successful athletes that we've worked with in recent years is they go into every single race with a really kind of, especially on the carbohydrate side actually, a pretty rigid idea of what they're going to try and hit. Now it doesn't mean it remains completely rigid throughout the race, but they'll, if they're aiming for 90 grams an hour, we'd expect them to be within, you know, plus minus 10 or 15 grams of that. And they're keeping a mental tally of that as the race is going on. They know what's in their bottles, they know what's in the things they're picking up. And it's all about that sort of pre-planning, knowing what zone you need to hit. We know it's not too little, we know it's not too much. We've tested it in training and got comfortable with it, but then critically, we're also able to adjust it a bit on the day. Well, now um, sort of answered both the too much carb, too little. Um, how about the fluids? You touched on it, but let's dive into that a little bit more. Fluids, fluid is more fluid. A little bit. <laughs> um, that's because sweat rates, sodium loss vary between individuals and even vary for you as an individual in different climates. You know, you, you're going to lose way more in Kona than you would in the Norseman, for example. So planning your fluid consumption needs a little bit more trial and error. You know, some people essentially, though, as a rule of thumb, if you're a big sweater, if you lose a lot of sweat, you're going to need to replace a lot more fluid and a lot more sodium than someone who sweats a little bit. There's, the range for that is pretty huge. When we look at our case studies in Ironman, for example, we see athletes in Kona, some will drink as little as half a litre an hour, which in those conditions is a really, really light amount of fluid and only a few hundred milligrams of sodium. Others will take you know, well in excess of a litre an hour, maybe heading towards one and a half litres an hour, which is an incredible amount of fluid to take in. And so it's, it's a case of with, with sweat and hydration, it's like understanding your body's needs doing some lab testing and or some field testing in the right environment to get a sense for what that level of replacement would be. Then very much as it is with carbohydrate, as you're on the bike, you're keeping a, like a mental inventory. How many bottles have I gone through? How many bottles have I picked up? How much sodium have I taken? How much fluid have I taken? And if you've got in your head what those numbers and ratios should be, it becomes a lot more straightforward to stay in the right zone. The thing with fluid consumption is I would say even more than carbohydrate consumption, you do need to really be prepared to adjust it on the fly because your sweat rate can vary quite a lot and what you thought was going to work. You know, in Kona, we saw it in uh, this year with some of the elite athletes take, picking up way more bottles of water on the bike than they suspected they would. Part of that was just with some of them was lack of experience of those conditions because Kona is next level when it comes to sweat loss. So rather than picking up you know, a bottle of water at every other aid station, they were picking one up at every aid station and then taking a lot more in. But that's a good thing because they're listening to their bodies and they're responding to thirst. At the same time, if you're feeling bloated, starting to pee, or just feeling like you've got fluid sloshing around in your stomach, you don't just plow on taking the exact level of fluid that you plan to, regardless, because your body's telling you this mm. is too much. 
Another thing that's worth mentioning anytime you talk about nutrition fails in races is pacing, because the two go hand in hand. We all know that you know, even pacing or accurate pacing is a key, a key that underpins a good performance. And if you go out too hard, you present yourself with nutritional and hydration challenges in two dimensions. One is you're probably gonna sweat more and you're gonna burn energy faster than you expected to. So you, whatever plan you have may not account for that. And secondly, you're gonna do things like divert less blood flow to the gut. You're, you're also going to be less inclined to eat and drink because you're putting yourself under stress and duress. So you can end up in this like really nasty, vicious cycle where you go too hard, you sweat more, you burn more energy, you drink less, you eat less, and you fall off the cliff even worse. And we've seen that so many times where people have put their, they've put their race failure down to a nutritional issue, and it kind of is, but actually the roots of it are more in pacing. So whenever you're talking about getting your nutrition right, you've got to think that's on the basis of executing a good pacing plan as well. Uh, sounds like not only do you need to be a triathlete, you need to be a mathematician as well. Yeah, you're not there. yeah. engineers make the best <laughs> triathletes. That's why Leon's doing so well. It could well be. Yeah. Okay, and then breakfast or dinner prior to the race, um, what can we do to solve some of the issues there? It's all about planning. You know, like you plan your race nutrition, you're going to plan what you're going to have. You know, for me, it would be pretty much all of the day before and the morning of the race. Can I just jump in there though? Because when you're traveling abroad, you don't always have the opportunity to plan Perfectly. No, you don't. Um, and that's I learned that the hard way when I travelled to Poland for a race in mm. 1998. And the food there was kind of these questionable meat stews and things that and I had no idea. And I made the mistake there of not taking any food with mm. me. I didn't even take, you know, I was, I was big on malt loaf for fueling my training back in the day. And I didn't even take my trusty supply of malt loaf. And, and I learned the hard way there that you've got to take stuff with you. I, you, you may, not everyone wants to go to the level that some pro athletes do, but I know a lot of pro athletes sort of travel with rice and rice cookers and that sort of stuff, so they can make their own food the day before. I think when you're traveling to a, a race venue that's in a kind of modern, westernized type place, you can probably make a decent prediction on what type of foods are gonna be available. In the week before, I would be scoping out the restaurants if you're eating out that where you wanna eat, making reservations. Even better than that, going to the supermarkets if you're self-catering and stocking up, and it's just part of that that process of being organised. You know, we've all heard stories about people who've in in in, in sport. You know, Usain Bolt eating his chicken nuggets you know, from McDonald's the night before the race or whatever. But I think in reality, it's you 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 increase the odds of success by controlling the controllables with your pre-race meals. Okay, and then finally, too much caffeine. Again, this is just this is mainly. An education point like three to six milligrams per kilo work out work that out from your body weight you know that's a sensible dose for most people to aim for remember that with caffeine as well taking it you want to take it before a long distance race probably immediately before and during the race and not save it right to the end because caffeine takes an hour or so to peak in your bloodstream and then like all these other points try it out in training try it out in minor races so that you actually you know build up a database of experience of how it works for you and we've spoken about this more before but do you need a caffeine gel prior to an ironman race i would say in the in the athletes that we're working with it's probably about 50 50. okay some do some it's part of their ritual others and i would put myself in this camp to an extent if you if you do get quite hyped before a race mm. anyway it might be something that you use once the race gets underway i'd normally have, still have a coffee or something with my breakfast mm. before because that's part of my usual daily routine but the idea for me of throwing in a caffeine gel 15 minutes when before when my heart rate's already going to be sky high, sky high yeah. and that sort of thing that that's not so appealing you know leon as an example leon chevalier always has a caffeine gel 10 minutes out from the start it just works for him so kicks in midway through the swim then. Yeah, and exactly. Through. And then how would you space them out? Would you sort of alternate? If you are someone that performs well on caffeine, would you sort of alternate caffeine, non-caffeine gels, say if you're taking it on through gel form? Yeah, it, take, it depends a lot on the dosage. So different gels will have, you know, you get gels with as little as 20 or 25 milligrams of caffeine, which is a really low amount, mm. and you get some which was punchy as 100. So it depends on the dose that you're aiming for and the and therefore it might be like one in every three or one in every five or something like that. But yeah, I, I think different people have different opinions on the efficacy of timing. Some 
I've heard some nutritionists talk about hitting a 200 milligram dose a couple of times through the race to give you kind of a big influx. Now, for me, I, I'm I'm less worried about you know how how you stagger it out as long as it's spread out and that you don't just sort of rely on it with 10k to go in the marathon because at that point you're going to be fueling the after party rather than the race itself. I used to do that. Well, thank you ever so much to Andy and Chris over at Precision Fuel and Hydration. They really are a fountain of knowledge. In fact, I do suggest heading on over to their website because there is a whole resource of information there. Talking of which, also do try out their nutrition plan on their website if you're heading into a race. On which note, I mean, one of the big takeaways from today is have a plan and stick to it. I know that I've certainly been guilty of, well, falling away from that plan at times when I've gone into a race. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you relate to any of those nutrition fails, then get involved in the comment section down below. And if you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up, give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe.